Hey everyone, I'm Matt Daniel with Dolan Divorce Lawyers in Connecticut. And today what I'm going to talk about is the procedure for a trial or a contested hearing in family court here in Connecticut. Now, a hearing takes place when the two parties in a case, they can't reach an agreement on certain issues. So they have to appear in front of a judge and put on evidence and the judge ultimately makes a decision. So the process starts um, with the counsel for both sides, if there are counsel or and the parties appearing in front of the judge. And usually what happens first is the judge will go kind of go over some housekeeping items to try to understand what the basic issues are in the case. And what the judge will often use as a guide are the trial management documents. And those I've outlined, outlined in a separate video, but what they're likely gonna to wanna to look at is the list of all pending motions, you know, to understand what the issues are. So in a divorce case, the, the main motion, uh, it, it's not really a motion, but the main item that's being pursued is either the, the divorce complaint uh, or the divorce uh, cross complaint, which is filed by the defendant, which is basically just saying, you know, you want a divorce, we haven't been able to reach an agreement on the issues of the case. Um, so, you know, the judge is ultimately divide, deciding all of the all of the facts of the divorce, you know, division of assets, custody, things like that. Or there might be a partial agreement. You might have a you might have a agreed upon parenting plan, but you need the judge to decide the financial side of the case. That's something you would want to tell the judge in the preliminary, you know, kind of housekeeping conversation. You might make reference to an agreement that is already filed with the court um, and, you know, let the judge know that finances are still in dispute. Or if it's a post judgment case, you may have certain motions that need to be decided. Well, the motions can be decided, there can be motions decided in either a regular divorce case or a post judgment case. So you might have a post judgment motion for contempt if somebody has violated a court order, post judgment motion for modification if somebody's seeking a modification to an existing court order, or you might have pendente lite motions, you know, if if the divorce is not yet finalized. For example, somebody violated a court order while the divorce was pending. You might be, you might be proceeding on a motion for contempt uh, for that violation. So you have that initial kind of housekeeping conversation where the judge understands the issues that are in dispute. And then either the plaintiff or the moving party, if it's a post-judgment case, they will start putting on their witnesses. So again, if it's, if it's a divorce, uh, the normal course of things is that the plaintiff goes first and they put on their first witness, or if it's a post-judgment motion for modification, whichever party brought that motion, they go first. So that could either be the plaintiff or the defendant. So how it goes is the, again, the plaintiff or moving party, they go first, so they will call their first witness. Um, and they will have that witness present testimony. Now that testimony cannot, you, the lawyer cannot ask the witnesses on their, they cannot ask their own witnesses leading questions. They have to ask more open-ended questions. And, that's the norm. There are exceptions to that, such as if there's an adverse witness, you can ask leading questions, even if you're the lawyer who calls that witness. So an example of that would be if the plaintiff calls as one of their witnesses, the defendant. So that's an adverse party. So you can ask leading questions of the defendant. Or another example might be if you are the plaintiff's attorney or you're the plaintiff and you're calling as a witness the defendant's girlfriend uh, that they've had an affair with the plaintiff uh, with. Well, that's probably an adverse witness. So in that situation, the plaintiff can ask leading questions of that witness, even though they themselves have called that witness. So some examples of non-leading questions, more open-ended questions are, when were you married? Do you have any children? How many children do you have? What are your children's names? What do you do for work? What is your income? What was the cause of the breakdown of your marriage? 
So you're asking more open-ended questions that allows the witness to kind of tell their story in response to those open-ended questions. Now, what also happens through testimony is uh, exhibits of physical evidence are introduced. So photos, emails, things like that. Those are elicited and introduced to the judge through the testimony of the witnesses. You know, and through that testimony, those those documents, which are called exhibits, those uh, those go to the judge, and I'll I'll create a separate video that talks about how evidence is introduced in a family law hearing. So once the you know once the counsel finishes asking questions of their own witness, then the opposing party has an opportunity to cross-examine that witness, so they can ask their own questions of the witness in response to the, the opposing side's questions. And in that situation, during cross-examination, the attorney or party, they can ask leading questions. And this is, you know, leading questions allow the person who's asking the questions to control the narrative a bit more than the person asking questions can when the when the questions are not leading. So some examples of leading questions are, you were married on January 14th, 1987, and you have three children and their names are Mark, Jerry, and Julie, and you work as a physician and your income is $350,000 per year. Isn't that correct? And the cause of the breakdown of your marriage is that you had an affair with your girlfriend. Isn't that correct? So those are those are examples of leading questions that you can ask on direct examination. And again, it allows the person asking the questions to control the narrative a bit more. So after cross-examination, you know, the lawyer will, or it doesn't necessarily have to be a lawyer. It can be a self-represented party. They will indicate to the judge that, you know, they have no additional questions. And, and let me just clarify. So technically, cross-examination is also supposed to be limited in scope to the questions that were asked in on direct examination. So, you know, your the cross-examination, the subjects that you're able to cover normally are limited to the subjects that were covered on direct. So if on direct examination, um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, the plaintiff testifies to the fact that she thinks you are having an affair and you know thinks the defendant was having an affair and they've been spending money inappropriately you know on on cross examination you have to kind of stay within the the subject of what was asked on direct so that's technically the rule it's often not followed in family court just because the judges will allow you know if the defendant will ultimately have an opportunity to re recall that witness as part of their own case so just to fast forward a little bit the plaintiff goes first the plaintiff or the moving party goes first where they call all their witnesses and then the defendant um or non-moving party they go second and they can call all the witnesses that they want so ultimately you can with one of the witnesses the defendant will be able to get into whatever topics they wish when they recall a party in the future um, so just for efficiency and to move things along the judge will often allow uh subjects to be covered on direct on cross-examination that were not covered on direct just because the opposing party will ultimately be able to you know call that witness back to the stand and cover whatever subjects they wish to cover um, so some judges will allow that but it's it's technically you're supposed to limit cross-examination to the scope of direct examination so after cross-examination, the person who initially called the witness, they have an opportunity for redirect where they can, you know, they can then ask uh, questions. Um, you know, they can again ask questions of the witness and and the redirect, there are no leading questions. So again, unless it's an adverse witness, again, you're supposed to, 
not ask leading questions. And redirect is supposed to be limited in scope to the subjects that were covered on cross-examination. You know, once redirect is finished, the lawyer or self-represented party will say they have no, no further questions. And then the other side might have an opportunity to recross the witness. And on recross, again, you can only cover the subjects that were covered on the redirect. So it basically can go back and forth, back and forth until the, you know, the testimony gets narrowed down and, you know, nobody has any other questions of that witness. So that's kind of the procedure on how one individual witness testifies. And then after that, the plaintiff or moving party, they'll have an opportunity to call their next witness. And it's the same process of direct examination, cross-examination, redirect examination, and recross-examination. So the plaintiff or moving party will call all of their witnesses in sequence, and eventually they will tell the judge that they have no additional witnesses. And at that point, the defendant or non-moving party, they will have an opportunity to call their own witnesses. And they can put on their case where they, you know, they might call the defendant or the plaintiff or other third parties. And it's the same process as before where the defendant or non-moving party will ask questions on direct where they're not supposed to be leading questions unless it's an adverse witness. And then there will be you know, cross-examination, which allows for leading questions and redirect and recross, et cetera. <clears throat> so ultimately the defendant will then call all of their witnesses. And when they are done, the plaintiff may have some rebuttal witnesses to call to rebut whatever, whatever was covered by the defendant's witnesses. So you may have to recall the plaintiff to, you know, to rebut some things that were covered during the defendant's case. And then that can go back and forth where, you know, so the plaintiff rests and then the defendant rests, they have nothing else, but the plaintiff wants to call some rebuttal witnesses and, you know, they call their witnesses and they finish. And then the defendant might call some rebuttal witnesses to, to, rebut anything that was covered during the plaintiff's rebuttal. So that can kind of go back and forth until eventually there will be no other witnesses and, you know, everybody has presented the evidence that they need to present. After that, you move on to closing arguments. So again, in Connecticut, there's no opening statements, but there are closing arguments, which is where both sides will essentially just summarize their case. So the plaintiff or the moving party, they usually go first and they'll, you know, they'll summarize, you know, they might summarize the background of the history of what happened. Um, but often what I like to do is to kind of just, you know, I'll give a little bit of background, but I like to use my proposed orders, which again, those proposed orders are in the trial management compliance documents. I like to use the proposed orders as a guide where I kind of just go through them with the judge and explain from a practical standpoint you know, this is what we're asking for, and maybe give a little bit of an explanation for why we're asking for what we're asking for. And then, you know, so the plaintiff makes their closing argument, and then the defendant, they will make their closing argument. And, you know, they'll summarize what they, you know, what they understand the facts of the case to be and what they think should happen. Um, after the defendant makes their closing argument, the plaint, you know, a lot of judges will allow the, you know, the plaintiff might make some rebuttal closing arguments points to rebut whatever the defendant said on their closing argument. And then the defendant might have some closing to rebut whatever the plaintiff said during their closing arguments. And ultimately, you know, that can ping pong back and forth a little bit until the closing arguments have finished. So those are kind of the basics of the, you know, how a hearing plays out from a practical standpoint. Sometimes judges can throw a little bit of a curveball, and they may not even want to hear testimony. If it's like a very simple disputed um, case, they might want to just hear argument instead where, you know, where both lawyers, they don't really call any witnesses they, um, they may just argue their case and kind of summarize the facts 
of the case and the judge will, you know, ask the witness, you know, they'll ask the parties, you know, do you, do you agree with everything your, your lawyer said? Um, and, you know, both sides will usually say yes, or they may add something additional and, you know, the, the judge will just make a decision. So that's, that's less common where the judge will just hear argument and that's in the more, the more, you know, simple, basic things, you know, usually it is the more, you know, formal, formal procedure where it is, you know, the initial background and then testimony of witnesses and closing arguments. So those are the basics of the procedure in a trial or contested hearing in family court here in Connecticut. If you have any additional questions or, you know, have need some help with your upcoming trial or hearing, please don't hesitate to reach out to our office. Have a good day.